hello and welcome everyone to our Black Voices Amplified Storytelling Series supported by Japan Airlines. Um, I'm an Action Mystery founder of Equality Leaders. Um, we are an impact focused organisation operating at the intersection of diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, our mission is to drive sustainable and impactful change designed to create thriving futures for our businesses and our communities. We exist to accelerate learning journeys, craft spaces for bold and inclusive conversations and provide the resources and tools to innovate equitable outcomes. Our team are guided by our purpose and values to deliver consultancy services, design bespoke learning experiences and of course host events such as today's storytelling event bringing people and communities together. Now during the month of October, Equality Leaders are going to be centering Black voices with our storytellers drawing from their personal experiences and inviting us in with courage, compassion and empathy. And today I have the very special privilege and honour to speak with my good friend Derek Um, Welcome Derek to the storytelling session today, this evening, and thank you for joining us this evening. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we were, we've actually known each other for many years, haven't we? Yeah. Uh, sorry that my wife couldn't couldn't join. Uh, she was looking forward to it, but because of like unforeseen circumstances, she couldn't couldn't make it this evening. That that's absolutely fine, Derek. Um, so Derek, welcome. Um, Derek is a Fijian born ex-soldier. Um, Derek was involved in a car accident when serving for the British Army in Afghanistan. Um, an explosion threw Derek from his Land Rover into a rubble of rocks, his body armour, his helmet and everything was blown off. Derek was so badly injured he said a prayer and made a pact with himself, fearing the worst that if, that if he was to survive he vowed he would be an inspiration to others. His next memory was him waking up in hospital in the UK with Anna, his wife, by his bedside. They knew their lives were going to change forever, crushing their dreams, their aspirations for the future. Fifteen months later from his injury, Derek found himself in Southern California training with an elite group of athletes. Derek Derenlagi is a game changer of his times. His remarkable journey, enduring physical, mental and emotional turmoil, sets him on a life changing path. Now a Paralympic discus thrower, representing Great Britain at the London 2012 Paralympic Games, he is also an ambassador for the Invictus Games from 2014 to 2017 and helped the heroes too. Derek is also a motivational speaker for military speakers and Olympic speakers. This evening, I'll be in conversation with Derek to find out more about his life, his journey and the work he is doing today to inspire others. Now, if anyone has any questions for Derek, please do drop them into the chat box and I will do my absolute best to ask as many questions as I can. So Derek, um, you were born in Fiji. Can you tell us what was life like growing up in Fiji and tell us a little bit about you, the young Derek growing up? Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, well, Fiji is a very late, late bit country and uh, well, it's an island uh, and um, it's in the middle of like the Pacific Ocean, uh, close to Australia, and New Zealand and uh, growing up in Fiji. Um, as I've said earlier on, it's very laid back, very relaxed. There's no like rushing around because I was I was I was born and raised in the village in a very, uh, rural setting, and um, there were no traffics, nothing. All I could see was uh, was the the jungle and an open sea where I go and uh, play with my mates, uh, go fishing, and that was life life like in the village, and most of that uh, still exists today. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the the climate, the, the the tropical climate. I suppose it was sun all year round. And 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 pardon me if my geography is wrong. Is Fiji on the um on the um uh, the equator? Was that sun all year round? Yeah, Fiji has like the tropical weather. Um, mainly sun all year round. But we have like our cold season as well. But our cold season is 
is our summer in the UK. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, I would say, sunny. We have, like, rain um, as, as, like, in, like, uh, tropical countries or tropical islands. So mostly yeah. it's uh, sunshine and humidity throughout from January to December. And it's uh, a very, I would say it's a very well um, known place for tourism or tourist de destination in, in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sounds amazing. And we've actually did to go to Fiji together, haven't we? So I'm actually looking forward to that. And, and what's your... Um, What's your first memory of Derek growing up? Do, do, you, do you recall that? I do. There, there's, there's so much, there's so many memories growing up in the village. Um, one is, uh, it's like there's no rush for things to be done, uh, very laid back. Um, fishing, uh, as a very, like, young kid, I uh, go fishing with my friends in the, like, nearby rivers or to an open sea um, and playing along the beach with the, um, because we like back in the days, like we were, I, I grew up in, in a very, very poor family. So there was no rugby ball. Fiji is known for like rugby. There was no rugby ball. So what we used was uh, an old coconut um, that they, they were lying mm. along the beaches. So we used that as, as a rugby ball and throw, throw it around and, and, and play around with, with my, my uh, friends back in in the days when I was a a, a young boy. So sport was part of you growing up from a very very young age. Played a really yeah. big part of your your, your every day. Yeah, that's that, that, that's one thing that that I I I will well will stay with me. Uh, it's like sports like every every other day apart from Sunday. Uh, just like running around and uh, along the beaches, along like the jungles, yeah, all the all the sort of things, uh, uh, yeah. And uh, I remember going 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 to school. Um, there was no there was no car, no school bus. There, there was school bus um, back then, but um, because I, I, as I've said earlier on, I came from a very very poor family, and um, I I lived with my grandma as I was growing up, and. Um, there was no source of in income in the family. So the way to school was to swim across the river uh, early in the morning and wow. swim in the, in the afternoon. And uh, yeah, th th and that was normal. Uh, that was normal. And uh, I didn't know any other way. So uh, like for me, for my wife, if my wife was sitting here, uh, because she came from a very, very good family. Uh, she, she, she went to, to school in a school bus in a car. But from people like me, uh, coming from like different backgrounds, from very poor background, uh, there was no other choice, either to swim across the river to go to school or walk the long way to school. Wow, wow, I, I never knew that. Um, so Derek, in, um, in 2000, you and your wife, Anna, um, with your young daughter, you moved to the UK. Yes. Leaving your two boys with your, your close family members, um, your parents, your brothers, sisters in Fiji. You then joined the British Army. What made you uproot your family and, and move them to the UK? And then what inspired you to join the British Army? Uh, one, one thing I, I would uh, say that inspired me uh, to join the British Army is uh, first was that Fiji was like, is part of the Commonwealth, and uh, and there was a story about like back in the 1960s, um, like there were 212 Fijian and few women that joined the British Army. Uh, there were the group called uh, 212 that they joined, joined the first Fiji lot to join the British Army, and even mm -hmm. before that, Fiji was part of like during the Second World War, Fiji was part of that. The war in Malaya and and in in the Pacific Islands, Fiji was part of of the British uh, uh, battalion that that were in that part of the world back back then and and during the, the Second World War and then in um, in in like 1950s 1960s that's where the the first lot of Fijian joined and one of them was was my uncle but he died like in the 19 70s, I think it was 1971, 19th of July, 1971. He died in Oman, 
in, in, in the Mirabad battle. He, when he joined the, the, the British forces, he later joined, on, joined in the, the Special Forces, the SAS, but he died in 1971. So me growing up in the village, hearing uh, the heroic story about what he did before he died, really inspired me and i think it didn't only inspire me it inspired a lot of fijian boys back in the village so but his story inspired me so much because i came from the same village as him and and that inspired me to join the british army mm. that, that's mm. that, that's your first question second was why did i bring my family over well because fiji is like it's it's in the other side of the world and uh, um, coming here like for myself coming here i was was very because I feel like homesick every now and again, like every day. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, I decided to, to bring my wife over with our daughter uh, to come over. Because uh, all I had was, uh, all I had, I had no one until my wife came and our daughter came. So that's that's the family that I, that, that I have or that we have. Just the three of us mm. in the UK. Mm -hmm. And you left your two boys behind mm -hmm. um, with your uh, extended family. How did that feel for you to, and how did you make that choice between who you brought with you and who perhaps you may, um, you know, left behind with, with the extended family? Well, it, it was quite a, a tough decision to make. And um, because it, it was like very expensive to bring all my family together and the cost of visa and the cost of, cost of like travel travel expense everything was was even expensive then and it's even expensive today so we 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 we, we end up like we we had a talk and um, that my wife and I we sat together and we we talk and then we decided to bring our daughter first and then our two boys later but our two boys were staying staying with our parents which is their grandparents so so when when things times goes on and 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 my, our boys were growing up in, in in Fiji, but when the time it was like for, the, for us to go and, and try to, to get them over, they decided no, we, we don't want to go come to the UK because they had so many excuses, and uh, they said we we okay to be to, to be with, with with the with our grandparents, and, and that was it. But we we kept on like uh, contact every now and again. Fantastic, fantastic. And I just want to go back to this um, this piece around you being in the British Army. Can you can you tell can you tell us what did it feel like to be in the British Army as a man of colour? And did you know that you're a man of colour? Um, did did that? How did it feel? Um. It was challenging. I mean, coming from from Fiji uh, to the UK, first time, uh, there were so many challenges. One was the weather. Second was uh, was the food. Third was the language barrier, and um, and and the other the other one was was color. And uh, uh, I blend in with with I mean, blend in very well with, with my British colleagues, British brothers uh, in, in the forces, uh, the camaraderie was there. Uh, there was no no such thing as like um, colour in, in, in when, when I joined, but but I, I won't, I'm not saying that they, they, they were not, no, there were no like uh, discrimination in, in, in the forces, they were. And, uh, but for me, uh, because I, I was brought, from where I, I came from, from, like what I've been taught as a, as, as a young kid back in the village, uh, it's just to, to respect, to listen, and to um, pay authority though, to those who are like, who, who are my elders or my superiors. And, uh, and, and that may, may have helped like my, my, my transition coming over into the UK and blending with the, with the military life. Um, but I, I had no, I had no, 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 no problem with with blending in with the with the rest of like the like the British uh, soldiers. But to be really honest, mm -hmm. it was like it was just like six of us, six of us like people with color, uh, like six Fijian. When we when I joined, there were uh, five other uh, Fijian boys that joined with me during that time, and uh, and we just blend in well um, uh, with the with the other uh, soldiers. 
Fantastic. That, that, that's, re that's really um, great to hear. And I know the British Army have done an amazing amount of work around diversity, equity and inclusion and the work that they are doing um, to embrace all communities within 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 the forces. Um, now, um, seven years later, in 2007, you were sent um, on tour of Afgan Afghanistan. Um, this actually became a pivotal moment in your life where your, your life changed forever on the morning of Thursday, the 19th of July. Can you share with us what happened that morning? Um, yeah, it was my, my second time around in, in Afghanistan. I uh, My first time was in 2005. Um, spent like seven months um, in Afghanistan, uh, came back in 2006 and went back in 2007. Um, on that morning, um, uh, it was like, it was different from any other morning, every other morning. Um, because the reason why I said that, because um, the, the, the sense of waking up in the morning on that 19th of July was very different from every other morning, as I've said earlier on. Uh, first thing that I would say, it was the quietness of that very morning was different. The stillness, I would say. And uh, I had a call. I was I was like on I was on guard, but I we were like rotating. And uh, I remember I, I woke up that morning, and um, I always do my prayer in the morning when I wake up, and uh, read my Bible. And then after that, and I was like like after doing that, I was just sitting down and um, like just waiting for my tent to go and relieve my my other colleagues who were on guard that morning. But we knew that we were about to, to go uh, to a nearby village. I had a call from my uh, my boss telling me, Derek, uh, where's the lads? Um, can you just uh, get them ready? Because uh, it's time for us to, to go before before uh, sun rises. Uh, we were due to go and, uh, and board a, a helicopter, a Chinook helicopter, to go to a nearby village. The reason being because it was so dangerous to travel on roads. Uh, we had like three vehicles on, on that on, on that day or every, every other day that we were there. So there were like three Land Rover vehicles. There was no roof, uh, like the Land Rover vehicle that we see on like movies. But within the Land Rovers, like everything was packed, like ammunition, explosive, <coughs> food, water, everything. Because we were like traveling from, from one place to another. We were like nomads. Uh, we didn't have any, any house to stay in or, or base because we were out for like two, three weeks in an open desert and then come back, replenish, and go back for another two or three weeks or four, even four weeks. So that morning when I had the call, I, um, I, I went, out, went out and, and get my, my other colleagues ready. So like within not even 10 minutes, we were up and ready, and we, we set off that morning to, to clear a helicopter landing site. After clearing the helicopter landing, landing site, uh, there was like a high ground that was nearby, like a hilltop. So we were told uh, to go, what? We were told like on a radio, our vehicle has to go up to that high ground. And then we just ended up going, going there first because we were like the lead vehicle. There were like three vehicles uh, on patrol that, that morning. So it was still dark, no, 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 no light, nothing. Every time we travel during the night, there was darkness. We were traveling in the dark all the time. No light is allowed. So as we reach the, the high point of that, uh, mountain top or hilltop. I looked around and um, and uh, and I, I saw like a big drop behind us. And just by the time we could see like the sun, like the sun rays were like coming at the at the back of the mountain because it's Afghanistan is a mountainous country. I don't know, like the listeners, uh, people that are in, in the call tonight may have seen the news. It's a mountainous country and. And it's like an open desert. There's no tree, nothing. It's it's bare. And um, so when 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 we when we park on that vehicle or, or on that like hilltop, we looked around. The only thing was was I could hear was the sound of our Land Rover. Apart from that, nothing else. So we we parked the vehicle, and then I looked around. I saw, like I said, I saw the the the, the cliff behind us. I said to the driver, to the driver, could you reverse the vehicle back? So as the vehicle, our vehicle reverses back towards like uh, the 
back part of that hilltop, that's when our the right rear wheel of our Land Rover, which I was standing right on top of it, stepped onto a hidden 44-gallon drum. And it wasn't even like a second when the, our vehicle, my two colleagues, and I got thrown up in a massive explosion. The, the last thing I remember, that I remember was, uh, was like looking at the distance, seeing someone standing by like a local person uh, in a local attire. And, um, and then as, as that happened, it, it, happened, it all happened within like, within like not even a second as the, the, the vehicle reversing. And then we got caught up in this big, massive explosion. I didn't know what happened to my other colleagues. All I remember was I got thrown and I landed on rocks, not knowing that my legs were gone. Um, I was in, 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 in a shock. I did know that my leg, both of my legs were gone, both above the knee. Everything that I was, like, I was wearing, like my bulletproof vest, my, my weapons, like we carry like three weapons each, apart from like the big machine gun that I was manning at the back of the vehicle. Even the machine gun was in pieces. Our vehicle was totally destroyed. And, um, and apart from that, I, uh, I just didn't know what, what, what happened. So as I, I, I laid on the rock, not knowing that my legs were gone, I tried to get out. When I tried to stand up, I, well, to get up, I had no, no strength. I, I was lost. Um, and then... I couldn't even move my body. The only part of my body, body that I, can, I could move was my head. So I tilted my, my head down. When I looked down, all I could see was blood. It was my own blood. I was lying in my own blood. And, uh, and that's when I saw that my legs were gone, both my legs. Um, I, could, I, I, I saw my, one of my legs that was like 10 yards from where, where I was, still intact. My foot was still intact. Uh, the boot. That I was wearing that morning was still intact onto my foot, but was lying like ten yards from where I was. So when I saw what I saw that day, I uh, I just lost it. I just knew it that this is it. I won't make it. I won't see my wife again. I won't say goodbye to her. I I, I was telling like my mind was like all over the place. I just knew it that this is it. This will be my last day on earth. And uh, I remember looking up to the sky and all I could see was like smoke, black smoke going like over my heads. And at the same time, we got attacked as well. I could see like traces were like going over my heads, um, like bullets. And I could hear like the sound of people shooting and screaming. There was chaos. And um, I look up and, and I said a prayer. And, and I said, uh, dear Lord, if it's your will to use me to motivate others, then give me life again. And, but if not, I, I surrender my body, soul and spirit to you right now because I knew this is it. I will make it. And there was a, there was a medic who found you. So you were actually pronounced dead when they found you. But there was a very special person, a medic, who felt a pulse in your body. And it was because of this medic, Derek, that we still have you today. And you said to me when we met recently, that you're now living on borrowed time. Tell us about that moment, if you can recall perhaps, when the medic found you and when they brought you to the UK. That was a really important, really in instrumental kind of moment in time that there was someone out there who found something within you and knew that there was still life, even if it was a very slow pulse, but they found you. Yeah, they, it, that happened in a, in, a, in a field hospital. I got flown out 
I got flown in from where the incident took place, um, that the medics were, were with, with us on the day. Like they chucked me in inside a waiting helicopter straight into like field hospital in the middle of the desert. And that's where I, I was pronounced dead in the field hospital. And uh, I remember what happened when, when the doctors and nurses were like cleaning my body to be put in a body bag. That's when the medic felt I had a slight pulse because I was pronounced dead. And then what they normally do is to, in every soldier that, that got injured or get, get killed in the battlefield, they, they do like three checks. So one when he's flown in and then every other like other procedures that need to be taken place uh, get to be taken place. And then second and third, the, the third check was straight after that for my body to be put in a body bag. That's when this medic found I had a slight pulse. So instead of me being put in a body bag and into a coffin, they changed the plan and uh, they tried to resuscitate me and tried to inject like oxygen and give me blood. And then they called in a, like um, uh, an RAF plane from from the UK to come to to Afghanistan to come and pick me and pick me back to the UK. So I was like the person in the plane with pilots and doctors. I was the only person that I, that I was told after when when I came around and got brought brought in in into um, Birmingham Hospital uh, at the Celiac Hospital, which is now the QE. But yeah, that that's right. I was pronounced dead on the operating table in Afghanistan. But I always say and. Uh, we always talk about my wife and I that um, we're just so blessed. I'm just so lucky and blessed that I I survived, and uh, and that's why I I always say we always say that that I I live in borrowed times because I was pronounced dead, and for me to be alive like over 15 years now, and to be doing let alone to be doing athletics, um, I'm just so thankful. I'm just so thankful to the source, to the God Almighty who is up there, and uh, for giving me the gift of life. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, individually and as a family, you would have, cha you would have uh, had an amount, immense amount of challenges. So what challenges did you face and how did you overcome them when all your plans and all your dreams were in ruins and you know you had your daughter here you had Anna here Anna was working your boys were in Fiji your parents were in Fiji I mean where did you even begin to start pulling your life together well, the the I would say like we had so many challenges. I remember I'll say a story that like when I when I came around from a coma, I was like nine days in a coma. When I came around, I, I saw my wife standing beside the bed and and because I didn't know where I was, uh, uh, and I said to my wife, um, can I go to the toilet? And then my wife said, no, you can't. And then I remember asking her, what are you doing here? Because I thought I was still in Afghanistan. I was still in the battlefield. And my wife said, you are no longer in Afghanistan. You are not in the battlefield. You are in the UK. You are in hospital. And then uh, what am I doing here? So we, we kept like a, a few minutes con con conversation. And then she said to me, because uh, I ended up asking if I can go to the toilet. And she said, you can't. Then I did insist for like three times. And then she came closer, took a picture of me. And showed me the picture and said, this is you now. That was like, like the first instant of like going through this big challenge. And uh, when I saw what I saw that day with both legs missing, I was lost. I just gave up. But one thing I would say is that I'm just so thankful that my wife stood beside me through all this. Because if my wife wouldn't be beside me like over this last 15 years, I wouldn't be where I am today because I remember a lot of my colleagues, um, they they are in a mess. They ended up committing suicide, not one, many of them. Even though they survived like the horrible injury, they ended up committing suicide because when they, when they try to turn to their left and right to look for support, there's no one there. 
And that is why I, I would say that I'm just so thankful to my wife for standing beside me through thick and thin. And we, we had to go through these challenges, uh, challenge of being a disabled person, uh, challenge of being like, like limitation in life. But, um, but without the, that support, I, as I've said earlier on, I wouldn't be where I am today. So the first challenge I would say was that like seeing that picture of me, no legs, and trying to to get my act together and uh, and try to think positive, uh, even mm -hmm. though I was in that situation. Um, but it wasn't easy. It was tough. There were so many ups and downs along the way. Uh, my wife was uh, was uh, the the thing that that challenged me was uh, that worried me was my wife. I I I don't know what my wife was thinking then whether she was willing to stay with me, whether she was willing to say goodbye and go, because I totally understand, because no one was prepared for what, what has happened. Because I wasn't, I wasn't, I never knew that I lost, I lose my legs in Afghanistan and suffering other 24 injuries. But uh, the only thing that I can say was that I'm just so thankful that my wife stood beside me through the journey for the last 15 years and and she's still here beside me today and i'm and she I, made I'm, many sacrifices oh yeah the way. She, yeah she did she she first sacrifice she did was she left her job to take care of me that, that that's a big challenge she left her job and then she took care of me for like for several years i remember the first few weeks months she had to carry me to the bathroom she had to carry me to the toilet. She had to like feed me. She had to clothe me, and uh, and uh, that's what I said earlier on. I don't know whether she was willing to stay or was willing to say goodbye and go because I totally understand. But she she never left. She gave up her job and stood and and carry on the journey with me. So I will be I will be ever ever so grateful for that. And I'm, I would say that I'm, I'm a lucky person to, for my wife, Anna, to be beside me through, through, through this, this journey. Thank you. And your daughter, amongst these challenges, your daughter that you brought over from Fiji, how did you manage, um, you know, her and her expectations and schooling and everything well the whole family was traumatized i uh, especially her was traumatized when she was like a little girl then and um uh, but we 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 managed to 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 hang on and uh, uh through through the journey uh but over the years as we we move on we 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 learn from from what has happened and 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 we talked about it, and uh, and today my uh, she's gone on and, and have had a whole family, and uh, yeah, so so we were traumatized. We were like went through like thick and thin, but we we, we managed to 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 keep going. Mm, mm, you sure did, um, Derek. You you are a real inspiration, and what you have done is you have turned this moment of adversity into an opportunity and now you're using your platform to inspire others um can you share with us some of the work that you are doing today well i uh, I'm, I'm i'm just so thankful for the for the opportunity and uh, i mean to 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 survive like the, the massive explosion uh and then went on to to represent great britain in paralympic games in world championship in the European Championships and in Invictus Games. Um, then apart from that, uh, apart from like after leaving the forces, um, I, I went on and, and did uh, like motivational talk to like many, many companies, uh, being an ambassador for, for many military charities in the UK. One being the like Health for Heroes, um, the, the Royal British Legion, the Army Benevolent Fund, uh, the Coming Home Campaign, uh, and um and many others and 
it, it's it's what I, I did on the day of explosion on the day of the explosion. I remember so well that inspired me today because I remember saying a prayer that I did say that in my prayer that if I survived, I I will be like giving my time to motivate and to encourage others, and that's what I am doing today. Um, sometimes I just volunteer and and go and help out with the disabled uh, charities for uh, children, children with disability and uh, and that's what I love I, I love I love being among people that that don't have like don't have the opportunity in life people come from like not a very well background and just to go out there and uh, and help them and and just to support them and one thing that we did my wife and I we often go out during like over the last 15 years, we go out and, and buy food and go out in the in the streets and uh, and uh, give food to homeless people. And and that, that's what we do today. And uh, we enjoy doing that, helping others. You're very inspirational, Derek. You really are, both you and Anna. Um, so, so, so what's next as part of your plans your you know you know your journey to Paralympics in 2024 we, we we discussed um how are you preparing for this you know physically and mentally and, and actually you're not going to be representing Britain next time are you you're going to be representing Fiji oh yeah yeah that, tell us about that yeah that's that's the plan um uh, uh it's not that I'm um abandoning like the the, the uh, Great Britain team it's uh, it's one thing that it's the thing that I, that I've talked about with my coach in the UK that um, I would like to like th this will be like my last Paralympic Games because I was at 2012 I couldn't make the 2016 because of injury and then the 2020 was because of the pandemic and uh, but my 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 plan is to like try and qualify and and do the 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 2024 Paris Paralympic Games. And because it's my last, uh, we've talked about my wife and I, and talk about talk with uh, my coach in the UK. It, it just to is to give something back to where I came from, where I'm originally from. I know that that I'm British here. I, I, I'm a British, British citizen, but it's something that I would like to give back to my local community, to my brothers and sisters back home, uh, and just to encourage the disabled people uh, in Fiji, and not in, not only in Fiji, but to the Pacific Islands, like Tonga, Samoa, the Cook Islands, because uh, disabled people in that part of the world are not really appreciated. They are classed as second class citizen. And that is the reason why I am going, trying to, to represent Great Britain, uh, Fiji at the 2024 Paralympic Games, is to give like, Motivation to my brothers and sisters are in the side of the world. It just to show it, show them that if I can do it with no legs, they can do it too. It doesn't matter what disability that they are in. And and that that's the plan. Uh, uh, my plan for now. Um, I'm still training. I, I'm no. I know that I'm. I'm not getting any younger. I'm getting older. Uh, sometimes the the intensity of training uh, I can't handle. But but I just. Uh, strive on and, and try to do as much as I can and um, and be competitive and that's the reason why I have made the choice to represent Fiji is to not not nothing to do with like meddling or winning medals it's to motivate my brothers and sisters in the Pacific Islands those who've been suffering from disability that if I can mm. do it they can do it too Absolutely, um, and um, and it is it is discussed throwing. Is it discussed throwing that you're going to be participating in? Yes, uh, my, my my main events are discus and and shot put. It's a seated discus and shot put. Yeah, I'm I'm seated on on, on a frame on a chair and I throw from that. And that fantastic. That Fantastic. So if you can't be, you can't see it. So I, I, I love the fact that you are doing this for your brothers and sisters and to inspire the future generation of Paralympians from whether it be from Britain or from Fiji or from any other part of the world. And and I suppose, you know, I mean, Derek, you and I have been uh, talking about supporting you to uh, Paris 2024. And I think if there is anybody here listening in today that 
you know, may want to support Derek in any shape or form, please, please, please do reach out to me, um, you know, by email or by LinkedIn. Um, Derek and I would love, love, love to have have a conversation with you. Um, thank you. Um, but Derek, um, what would you, I mean, if you were to give any advice, any tips, any thoughts, any challenges to, you know, our, our listeners, today um what would be your top three two three um things that you would like to um you know in, in knowledge that you'd like to impart with us well i would say that um like even even the world that we live in today we go through many challenges um uh, like from like work environment from like regarding the children, regarding anything. And what I, I'd like to say is that um, to encourage like people are listening this evening is that one thing that I always try, my wife and I always try to, to control is, is our mind because that is the battlefield in itself. And uh, we, we can't stop like, the challenge that we go through in life we can't stop people getting angry we can't stop like bills are going up we can't stop that but one thing that we have that we can handle is is to control the way that we think and that is one thing that i've learned my wife and i have learned over uh, regarding my injury and over the last 15 years if we can control our mind we can control the situation that that we, we go through in life because the way I see my injury is, even though I'm missing both legs and I suffered multi, other multiple injuries, I see my injuries as just a scratch. Because when I compare myself with other people, I mean, children who are born with disability, um, people who can't really talk, people who can't really hear, the, the people like with no, no vision. Uh, you, you look at the, the great Omen hospital, like children that are lying in, in the hospital bed, like those those injuries, those disability are even worse than than my injury. I, I see my disability as even though it's a disability, but I, I look at it as just a scratch. But one thing I'd like to advise like the listeners uh, this evening is that is just try not to give in and try not to give up. I know it's it's easy to say, but it's very difficult to do. But if we can control our mind in every whatever situation that we are in. We can calm the situation and we can still uh, live in a happy and, and a wonderful journey that we call life. And, and that's how I see it. I know it's, it's difficult. It won't be like rosy, rosy days every day. It won't be like good every day. There'll be challenges along the way. But if we stay calm, stay focused and stay motivated, it's, it's going to be like an amazing journey whether by yourself, with your family, with your husband, your wife, your partner, whoever it may be. And life is about the state of our mind, isn't it? It's all what happens in our mind that guides us, that nurtures us, that you know, it's all about our actions and behaviour, and it's all through our mind. And, and, and I suppose it takes a lot of discipline to discipline the mind. It does, yeah, it does. It, it takes, take, takes a lot to discipline the mind. When I say this, I'm not saying that people might might be thinking that are listening today that I'm, I'm superhuman. I'm, I'm I'm right there. No, I I got challenges every every other day. Every yeah, like mm -hmm. we, we we get arguments. My my wife and I, but it, it's part of the journey. It's just how we control ourselves. And um, like if I can do it for the last 15 years, um, I uh, I know many people have, have gone through like tough times, even tougher than what we went through. But if we can control our mind and calm ourselves in whatever situation that we go through, uh, it's going to be OK. Thank you. Thank you. Derek, Darren Lagi, um, thank you for talking to Equality Leaders about your life your journey and your aspirations for the future, your your journey from the battlefield to track and field. Um, you, you really have inspired 
definitely inspired me and I'm sure you have definitely inspired our listeners who have jo joined us today. It really has been a really great conversation. Um, I have a question from um, one of our, oh, here we go. I've just lost that question. It is somewhere here. Um, right, I have a question for you from one of our listeners. Derek from Dylan Shimon. Derek, do you do you work with any children's sports charities? I don't. I don't at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you do, would you please share that with us anytime in the future? Definite, definite. Yeah, that's 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 that, that's my plan after like after like retiring from elite sports. Uh, I would love mm -hmm. to get involved with the sports with children whether disabled children or not it doesn't really matter I, I, I would like I, I would be involved more well, I will involve myself like helping and encouraging and motivating younger generation to get involved in sports mm, mm, mm. absolutely we need to get more children out and about and get them more involved in sport absolutely no definitely and and, and we'd be very happy to support you with that um I, I've absolutely enjoyed um, our conversation today, Derek. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, any last thoughts you'd like to share, Derek, before I wrap up wrap up the evening? Is there another question that's just come in? Oh, I've got another question, if that's OK with you, Derek. Yeah. Um, how were you involved in the Commonwealth Games? How did you how did that how did that start that journey? Well, we uh, we got involved with the with Commonwealth Games, uh, the one uh, a few months ago in Birmingham. Um, we we had an email from like from Fiji, uh, from the Fiji um, Sports Council, um, asking uh, us to to be involved with with Team Fiji, because there there was a disabled athlete that was coming uh, from from Fiji. Uh, so so yeah, we just volunteered to to get involved. Uh, we went out in Birmingham, like uh, spending time with this disabled athlete, uh, a young girl representing Fiji in uh, discus for in, in, in her category. So we, we, we spent like three weeks with her, like training her. Uh, it was her first time in the UK. Yeah, a lot of things that she didn't know about throwing. Uh, she was like, uh, she was nowhere to be, to, I mean, to be seen during the game. So... During the game, when, when she competed, she ended up winning a medal, uh, winning a bronze medal at the at the Commonwealth Game in Birmingham, and um, and I'm just, my wife and I were so so happy. I mean, she 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 ended up winning a medal for Fiji, and uh, it, it's that that kind of thing that that inspired the both of us. I mean, to go out and and help uh, people, and that's how we we got involved with with the, the Commonwealth Games. It's we, we went out to to coach uh, uh, a disabled athlete from Fiji. Fantastic. I love the kind of grassroots community stuff that you're doing. And ha and has the pandemic affected you in any kind of way? Um, you know, a, a progress, you progressing as an athlete? It was, I did, that question has just come in. Yeah, the pandemic has really, I know it has affected a lot of people all, all over all over the UK, all over the world. And in my situation, um, it has affected my progress in my sports. I couldn't qualify to compete in Tokyo uh, in 2020 or last year. Uh, so, that, yeah, it has impacted my, my training. Um, I couldn't train. So it also impacted my, my mental health as well because uh, through my injury, I, I suffered from very from very complex PTSD uh, regarding my, my injury in, in, in the battlefield. Yeah, the pandemic has, has really affected me uh, in, in that form as well. But uh, we managed, my wife and I, we managed to, to just keep calm and just uh, keep on going. Um, we've done it already. Yeah, we will do it again. So yeah, I would say, yeah, it has impacted me um, or affected me, uh, uh, the pandemic. And I now believe a lot of people have been affected as well. I suppose you use um, discipline and this uh, and the the state of your mind to support you along the way. Fantastic. Well, Derek, thank you so much for 
um, joining us this evening. It's been a real honour to have this conversation with you and I and I actually you know having known you for so many years and I have just learned so many new things about you and your journey and your and your your journey to um, the next Olympics as well. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Mm -hmm.